I um, would like to share my story in a few ways and to answer the question of uh, what is it to decolonize a culture that is already strong traditionally. I think that's a really uh, different type of lens. A lot of, a lot of the focus when I was in the US, um, which I spent some time and I'll share about that, uh, was about getting people to turn their lens into uh, the indigenous framework that was possibly there, but not known. And I come from a really strong heritage. I am Māori, my iwi, uh, Ngāti Pūrau, Ngā Puhi, Ngāti Kahunganu, uh, Te Rarua. And they encompass um, uh, tribes, tribal territories in the North Island of Aotearoa, New Zealand. And um, I guess my work in the world as a contemporary dance maker primarily, and then beyond that, a facilitator of cultural spaces and thinking um, through many, many disciplines, um, bring many of these threads and connections together. So um, I hope that the sharing that I do today, both visually and sonically, can uh, open a doorway for us to enter into and to um, have a conversation of things that might be of interest to us. So kia ora everyone. Okay, here we go, screen sharing. It's always the nervous bit. Oh my gosh, where did it go? Okay, there it is. Ding, ding, ding. All right. So I'm just going to speak to a series of slides and um, yeah, and, and, and as, you, as we go along, if questions emerge or if something kind of you want to know a little bit more about, feel free to write it in the chat thing and then perhaps we can explore that later at the end when we do more um, exchanges together. So uh, I want to start with this image, which for those that don't know is the backstage of a theatre and it's the part where the, where the dancer walks through and they come into the on, on stage and, and what happens is, is that when it goes to blackout, you're in complete darkness, right? And so I wanted to conjure up this darkness before. Uh, in the cosmology of Maritanga, we think about te kore, which is the space of formlessness and potentiality. And this is how our creation began in our thinking. And so we hark back to the cosmologies of how the universe, the Māori universe began in the nothing. And as a dance maker, these are the qualities and things that I always think about before I create work, before I perform. Um, it's that space of entering into ritual, entering into beingness and how is it that without the need to decolonize, how can we go back to potential? What does that mean to strip things away? This image here is uh, a representation of our celebration of 21 years as a Māori contemporary dance company. So in 2000, I formed Atamita. Atamita is the Māori word for platform. And I chose it as the word for a stage or a, literally a platform for Māori artists, Māori dance makers to come together to create work that was inspired by our whakapapa and our stories and also our current and urban experiences and what that means. Um, a place to consider the, the lives of our ancestors and also um, the issues. And one of the interesting uh, concepts of the word atameter, which I found out after, was that actually the platform had a deeper meaning and the meaning of it was connected to a platform made out of rocks or it could have been made out of woven mats that the, the dead bodies were placed upon as a, for the ritual of going into the afterlife. And uh, these bodies, the tupapaku, were placed on the altar, placed on the atameta, and uh, they were wrapped and they were placed in sacred spaces that were overseen by what we call a tohunga or uh, a way of thinking about that would be a healer or a, a medicine person, a sacred person who, and that process of uh, the body degrading and the body um, uh, being worn away by elements of nature going back to the earth um, is, a, is what the atameta was for. But of course, when uh, missionary and um, yeah, missionaries came to our country and Catholicism and Christianity spread, um, these practices were forbidden. And so we lost that knowledge of how, our, how we would explore the, the shifting of the body from this realm to the next realm. 
And so in many ways, Atamira is a, as a space for me to create and other Māori people to create, it kind of opens up all of those questions um, and brings forth things that are deeper than the current um, pressures and stresses that we feel in the modern world. This image here is me standing in front of, with a, with a group of friends who have come to support me. Um, we're in Chicago, Illinois, and we are at the Field Museum um, which I don't know if any of you have been, but my Farinui, which the Farinui is the traditional longhouse for Māori. Um, my house, my father's house is in the museum. And there's a gigantic story connected to Rua Te Pupuke, um, which I won't go into, but uh, I'm working through ways in which these, um, what we call taonga or uh, treasures or cherished and important and significant things that we are of and from, uh, how we come back into relationality with them despite the, the dislocation that has occurred historically. Um, yes, and so I, I came to the museum several times and worked with the institution whilst I was, a, um, I guess, an Indigenous dance scholar at uh, Asian Pacific American Institute at New York. Um, I was supported to be able to go and do these intervenings. And in this particular scene, um, I have photoshopped it so it looks as kind of dislocated as it felt, um, but we were exploring notions of how is it that you can be welcomed onto your home when there are no people there to welcome you? And uh, and traditionally in our protocols, uh, of course, the house is always kept warm through inhabitants and through uh, the mana whenua or the people of the land who hold the power of uh, custodianship of that place. And they welcome manuhiri, they welcome people from afar. But in this case, the house is there um, in its own space and uh, in the custodianship of a greater institution, which is the Chicago Field Museum. Uh, one of these interventions was me bringing people ceremonially into the space. And uh, um, I this image here of me dancing in front of what you can see are uh, beautifully carved ancestor faces, these um, fakairo or carved um, emblems um, run up the side in the front of this fari, and you can see that there are eyes, lots and lots of different eyes. Um, this is one a really super unique fari nui because that's not a usual factor, and so probably one of the reasons why uh, the curiosity collector who came in, who came and bargained for it and took it to Europe and then took it to the World Fair, um, you know why it was such a beautiful specimen. And yeah, it was just really interesting. I think when I first came into contact with the space and, and just being witnessed, like I felt like those eyes were piercing into me, all of my ancestors looking at me and, and I invite you to think about what that might feel like. Oops, is it gonna move? Oh, sorry. Hang on, here we go, all right. So this image here was taken last year and it's the dance company that I am the artistic director of. Um, I just give a little bit of a background. So I was a founding member. There were four of us who founded Artemita Dance Company. And then I went abroad and I, I was young at the time and wanted to travel around the world and learn lots of things. And then I came home and then I was a dancer for the next period of my life. And then I wanted to go away and then I went to the US and uh, was working with Jackie Shane Murphy, for example, who's in the Zoom at UC Riverside and other spaces in the field of indigenous dance. Um, but then I came home in 2017 to take on the artistic directorship of the company and yeah, have been navigating COVID through the last couple of years, which has been really different, I must admit. Um, but one of the things we were able to do was perform uh, what you can't see is that what the dancers are standing in is actually a, um, a pool of water. And it's a, um, it, the event was Toy to Toy Order exhibition opening. It was the, the largest survey of Māori visual contemporary art 
that we've ever had in the country inside the gallery, where all levels of the gallery were, were had Māori art on it and all existing collections were taken out. And it's the first time ever in our country that only solely Māori art has been in um, at one of our national institutions. And so we were part of uh, the activations of the opening weekend and we did a performance that was, um, I guess, standing there in space of our traditional welcoming protocols um, we interpreted this in a different way. But also one of my main purposes was to put the body of the contemporary Māori artist in the space as art, um, as opposed to um, something that is done and you're looking at it archaically, but it's still living and breathing and moving inside of us and we are the visual artists as well. So um, that was one of the interventions. And you can look around and just see how it captured people's interests. And, and I feel really excited to think that these kids who are even in the front, um, you know, are exposed to Māori dance at such a young age in a different type of way than the stereotypical traditions that they're used to seeing. Uh, this is my mother's house, and um, she comes from Miti Miti in the Hokianga, which is up north, one of the most beautiful, beautiful places. And um, this is post restoration so the house itself had come into degradation it was old it was wind battered um, most Māori communities um, experienced a, a term called urban drift so around the 1950s 60s post-war um, a lot of the opportunities for people to sustain themselves on their land kind of dried up and people needed to move elsewhere so the reason why I was born in in Auckland in Tamaki Makoto um, and my generation have, have been raised away from our family lands is because of our folks needing to um, get ahead in their minds and, um, you know, become part of urban society. Um, but what that meant was that uh, there weren't enough people staying home, being born at home and being able to carry on the traditions and being able to warm the house and keep it activated and having the resources to be able to do that. So we, there was a TV show called Marae DIY. And Marae is the, the, the area in which, um, yeah, the community is in all the different houses uh, the urupa or the cemetery and, and all the things that we denote as our life, that's called the marae and every Māori belongs to a marae or several, um, but the marae DIY, do it yourself TV show was, was a Māori TV show that went around and um, brought community back home from all over to, to physically restore the house um, and I, you know I, I'm, I actually painted the side of there and I painted these fences and I'm, I'm pretty happy about that. Uh, this image here is connecting to um, work that I was doing around Miti Miti. So that place, um, I was exploring the digital realm as a way to connect Fano or connect family. And with this idea that people who whose ancestry lay in that place or their ancestors come from that place, but they themselves may have been born elsewhere um, I developed this campaign called hashtag Miti Miti, hashtag where you at? And it was actually a real interesting thing because people who were actually from that place were able to send where they were from all over the country, but also further afield from Australia. And then it just became about solidarity around how the energy of locating yourself back in your ancestral lands really connected to everyone. And so it, it had a really broad appeal and it was really um, the ways in which people were thinking about land, sea, ocean relationship were really powerful and really interesting. And also something that I love, which is giving people the opportunity to self-express. Uh, this image here is connected to the show. This is a rehearsal um, for my piece, Miti Miti. And um, I've got some other, oh, no, there are no more images. Okay, that was that. Here we are. We're on to our next scenario. So... Um, part of the other work that I do is being involved in, I would say, kind of more inter-arts festivals where there might be activations or workshops or labs. Um, that's one of the things I really, really get interested in because I think it's a chance to bring people into a holding space where they can consider 
things of uh, connectivity that they may or may not have thought about. So we were here in Wellington, which is our capital city, and we were eating what you can see up in the corner, fish and chips. Very Kiwi thing, very British thing. And the fish and chips was a koha or donation for everyone to come and just share in some food. And then in the meanwhile, whilst we were eating, people were um, literally digesting and thinking around um, some of the topics of relationality to land. And so I gave them some tools. And, you know, one thing I love about mark making as a process is that it doesn't matter how old you are. And I think that inclusivity allows expression and connection to flow. Um, and I feel like everyone, no matter what age you are, has a sense of connection and belonging or a potential to. I took those um, papers that everyone had eaten on and I made an artwork and I, I, I don't know why, I just kind of think it's hilarious, right? Like it was just more just to be funny that we can continually transform our genealogy, our musings, our relationships and kind of create a collective sense of what that might be um, and how we might look at it and how we might view it. And then I ended up um, posting this on the wall at the event center. And um, there was something about that it had grease on it, that people's hands had touched it, that, you know, bits of food were still stuck to it, that you, instead of like people used tomato sauce as like a coloring in, it was kind of interesting, but I kind of, I don't know, there was something about that kind of visceral connectivity. Um, a, a, a group that I coordinated a few years ago was called I Moving Lab. And the I stands for Interdisciplinary, Indigenous, Intercultural, International. And we made this lab because oftentimes when you're working in a specific genre or art form, you don't actually get to cross with other thinkers. And you, and it's to me, it's not really the what you end up doing, like what the product is of your thinking is, is not at the forefront. It's how you think how you come together, how you converse and collaborate and why, and, and then what are ways in which we can um, explore with audiences and what is an audience. So uh, I like leading people into outdoor spaces and taking them on these kind of ridiculous journeys. Um, this is just some imagery of uh, community-based work, volunteerism, um, and, and looking at ways in which people's sovereignty is being expressed. Um, and this was in Hawaii at a, um, a place where they were, yeah, really looking at uh, how they were cultivating food for their community. This was an image of a potluck dinner that we did. Um, we did a series of these. This one was in uh, Multnomah, which is Portland, Oregon. And one thing that was really super interesting was that um, when I was doing this work, it was really for little funding. So we really didn't have any money. Um, but what we did do was do a lot of outreach and, uh, and most of the things were donated or they were people's spaces that were open to us. And then we were, and then for example, this one was a dancer's house and she had done a workshop with us and then said, hey, look, come and do the potluck at my house. The only thing is I'm not going to be there. So the key is underneath the carpet. And what was really funny is that all the people who came to share food and cook food that day, we all didn't know each other and someone turned up, opened the house and we all piled into this house and we were all like, where's the salt? And we we're all looking around. And I thought there was, that was such a beautiful example of generosity and trust and true community. And then by the time we'd cooked everything and made it look so beautiful, the person who owned the house came home and she was like, whoa, that's amazing. And I, and I love that. And I think that, you know, that could happen more than less. Um, this is an image of us taking people at a contact improvisation workshop into a public space. I, I think about public spaces that are, are merely to look at as opposed to be in. And I love dance for the purpose of kind of messing things up a little bit. And, you know, what's the worst that can happen that we'll just get told to get out? And we're like, OK. <laughs> so I kind of like to break rules in that way. But of course, it's a different climate now with COVID. And I'll probably be more thoughtful about it. But the, these little moments of like, like the activation as opposed to protest. Um, just coming back home, uh, this is this this is the dance company. And 
you know, we, we're exploring different ways of being and creating. And this day was a day that we walked up a volcano where uh, Auckland has about 50 volcanoes. And this one is out in the middle of the ocean. It's called Rangitoto and it's so beautiful. And our um, elder here in the corner um, has taken us up and he's sharing all of the different traditions and stories that have been amassed over a thousand years that stay on this island. And, you know, I think sometimes too, that it is hard to dance and present and create without the input. So a lot of our work is also just about how we're receiving information that we can then um, manifest through our creative energies. Um, this image here is just kind of, for me, it's about representing the next generation. Um, these two come from a, you know, they're tertiary graduate students. So they come from the, the tertiary providers. So most of the dancers who come into our company are dancers who have trained in contemporary dance primarily, um, who identify or are, who are Māori. And, um, and then when they come into our company, a lot of them have a, have very little, have had very little connectivity to their traditions and their understanding of their identity. So we have to bring lots of different ways for them to engage and start to understand what it means to be a dancer and to be a Māori dancer. Um, this is a piece from our most recent work called Te Whike. And Te Whike means the octopus. It, the, the inspiration that we're currently working from is uh, from an elder called Dr. Rose Pere, and she passed away but her work was around healing and, and wellness. And so she used the idea of the octopus and it's eight tentacles and each tentacle representing a facet of the human dimension. And so we created a work bringing together uh, the new emerging artists and our senior practitioners and brought them together to create this celebration work. Um, and it was, yeah, it was, it's been really beautiful this year to be able to present and tour. And, uh, you know, we've managed to be able to tour in and between lockdowns and things. But definitely, I'd say that we are questioning what's next. Um, is the theatre going to be, continue to be the apparatus by which our stories are shared? Or are there other forms? Are there online forms? Are there digital forms? Um, what is next for Māori dance? And yeah, this final picture is um, about process and what we do, which is to honor our ancestors, to come together, to share our words of wisdom and, and support for each other and support for the space. And then also realizing how much we take on into our bodies and this intergenerational trauma shifting that we're completely doing. And then what it is to stand tall in ourselves and to just release ourselves into the world. So that is Jack Ray's work in it. Nutshell. Kilda. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. I'm wondering, actually, I was going to go straight into the next thing, but that was quite the download. And I'm wondering if there might be some initial, I know we're going to do Q&A later, but I th sometimes think people need to breathe and let something out a little bit. So I'm just going to open the space if anyone wants to make any comments at this point. I, I do, actually. I would love for you to elaborate a little bit. And I know we're going to talk a little bit later, but you made a comment earlier about going back to potential. What is right. that? What is that? I want you to unearth that a little bit for us, going back to potential. Yeah. Thanks for that question. Um, oh, goodness. Okay. So, okay. Well, it's quite hard to describe, but maybe I'll just start talking. <laughs> maybe... Um, so when I think about our the way that our cosmology is structured, there's kind of three basic parts. And the first part is absolutely, I don't want to say nothing in a negative term, but just more like the nothingness. Like what is the nothingness? And and it's not that there's it's 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 almost like no perception. There's no sound, there's there's no concept of sound, there's no concept of moving. It's like before, before, before. And actually there's no before because we're still working with time. So it's, there's a part in the world, in the universe, that is nothing. And then the next part of that 
starts to evolve. And uh, there's traditional chants in our culture that talk through whakapapa. So I'm just going to write that word down so it doesn't sound like I'm swearing. I'm being funny, by the way. <coughs> um, okay, everyone in the meeting. So here it is, whakapapa. And uh, WH is F sounding, whakapapa. And um, that's a really interesting word because the two parts of it, papa, papa connects to papa tuanuku, which we understand as the earth mother. And Aranginui is the sky father. And so before, so in the nothing, the next stage is the concept of Rangi and Papa, the earth and sky connected. And as we understand them, they were in an embrace, a really deep, deep embrace. Like, and when we're talking time cycles, we're, we're like so timeless, so infinite, so long. And so uh, inside of their love, they uh, birthed what we call the Atua. And the Atua are the different deities or the different elemental forces. So, for example, the Atua of the ocean is Tangaroa. So that's, so people, like, I'll just use a different word so that might be more understandable. So in the, in the, colonial days we'd we'd say the god of the ocean but now we don't really use those words in those ways because of the connotations um it's more like the elemental forces or the uh one thing that i was taught was that the yeah i i was taught up knowing all of these different atua the different atua of the forest of the sky of the rumbles in the earth of cultivated food uncultivated food the wind, like there, there's a there's a beingness for each single part of the universe. And the being, um, the Atua, it, when I was young, I used to think about them like superheroes, you know what I mean? Like, I am Tangaroa, god of the ocean, raw. And, you know, like you, you, as a kid, you kind of imagine them as these superhuman beings. And then when I was older, I went, I went into a process of wānanga. I'm just going to write that down. So wānanga means, it's so funny, isn't it? It's like I have to explain everything. <laughs> wānanga is, uh, is about this. Like what we're doing now is a wānanga. We're sitting, contemplating, thinking in space and time. That's exactly what it means. And, and for the purpose of knowledge creation, you know, and sharing and transmission, which is nuts. Anywho. Um, yeah, so this in in the Wananga that I grew up, uh, one of the most beautiful things was uh, I'm going to write his name, Charles Royal, um, in the Fari Tapiri. If you just Google that, you will find an amazing stuff around these um, pre-colonial houses of dance uh, for Māori. So he did all this research into the fragments of knowledge that we had remaining. But he said to me that the Atua, um, uh, uh, it's not the god of the sea, it is the sea. Tangaroa is the ocean. You know, so when you're thinking about who is the god of the ocean, it's the ocean itself. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And so that, that was kind of like this beautiful little twist in my head. But um, so in our timeline, the, the earth and the sky were connected and they birthed all of the elements of the known universe. And then in so doing, what, what the, the, there's this beautiful thing that where um, the earth and sky didn't want to separate. They wanted to stay in the embrace forever. But of course, you've got all these kids going, uh, can I get out, please? <laughs> and they hatched a plan and they had to talk about it. And they were like, mm, do we want to stay at home forever? Or can we like stretch out a little bit? And, um, and then someone's like, okay, we're going to kill them. That's the only way. And then someone's like, no, I don't. And so in this kind of chasm of like deliberation about self, the understanding of self, uh, you, you get these polarizing things. And so the, the end result was that um, Tani, the god of the forest, 
Atua of the forest hopped on his back and he pushed the sky away with his legs. And we we call our great Kauri trees like Tani Mahuta because they push the sky away and they're really big, big, big trees. So I love how these kind of things kind of line up in the mind. And, and it demonstrated that, you know, that that already these ideas of values and lessons and ways of being and thinking and and the the pain of separation and and the the rain that comes back down to the earth is about tears and the mist that rises is about femininity reaching upwards. And we have all these ideas and concepts of masculine and feminine um, exchange and connect. So potentiality is before all of that. And I think that, um, yeah, that, that to me, how do I read that? Well, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I think that I just ask myself those questions. Like I, you know, there's there's no way to actually become the potential. So it's like just entertaining the idea that there is potentiality kind of opens your mind a little bit. Like it just kind of, it's like, it's, it's creating the space that was created from that crampness. It's like, oh, we just need to think and breathe and not kill anyone, but perhaps uh, just open up a little bit to feel sadness of separation damn it you know like the dichotomy of of what we do like the the arc of art making is like I, I always feel so vulnerable and so raw when I put work out there and I, I there's a part of me that hates that feeling because I'm like oh it was so personal and private and so connected to me and it's like connected to my ancestors and now I've just sold a ticket to it what the hell <laughs> you know and and kind of thinking about all those things but actually what gauge what I gauge with is how people feel and then what they what it means to them and I just want to also ask Megan at this moment because it's such a jack thing to do um Megan can you respond because you've reviewed Atomita's work and just to kind of demonstrate perhaps some of the yeah what I'm speaking to and how you've received it and articulated I think that might give a nice demonstration to everyone about what I'm sort of where I'm coming from and then also what that might mean to you as a Pakeha New Zealander sorry okay um when I'll just speak to how um I feel when I'm um going to see Atamira's work um start, I'll start there um I am always in a sense of anticipation. So that space of potentiality is always there for me. I've, um, over the years, I've realised that um, that's how I walk through the door. Um, and the work always, um, I'm always cellularly um, kind of involved in the work. So I always experience the layers of my own being and presence to where I'm at in the world, um, being uncovered and exposed and brought into relationship through movement. And, um, and as the work unfolds, I'm just part of um, this life-giving experience that Atamira brings through contemporary Māori dance. Um, for me, um, it's always living, breathing, work, or the whatever the story, however it unfolds. Um, the idea that Jack's talking about of of say Tangaroa being the ocean is Tangaroa. That is what's there, and that's what really resonates for me personally and privately. And that's a very important. Um, discernment to other forms of contemporary dance and how they choreograph and unfold their themes. So sometimes um, when I've seen other work, it's it's not quite touching into those spaces, right? And so it's a really different level of experience or a different moment of experience. Um, yeah. <laughs> As a reviewer, I'm very aware of um, the language that I use and 
how I will um, write about what is in front of me. And so I can only, I, I refer to what my um, my body experiences with that and my spiritual experience is to it, how that unfolds. And I write accordingly to that. Uh, I don't, is that, yeah. do you want is that what you would like, Jack? Yeah, no, that's fine. That's beautiful. I think I think it's given an insight because I, you know, it's obviously really hard to talk about something without being there and seeing it and that experience. Is. And so I think it's really it's just helpful for me to have someone else in the space um, that can kind of offer another alternate reflection. But also um, something else I think that's really key is language because obviously, yeah. even in the sharing today, and I try really hard to articulate in English, the concepts and yeah. the, the of the language and are actually so from another realm. It's a totally different world. Like yeah. the, the Maori worldview is completely different to the Western worldview that we inhabit. And so the work is for me around making sense of the two scapes together yeah. without a sense of fusing them or or idealizing what that relationship looks like but actually being mm. able to push against both and what it means to um to you know i think that there are this potentiality is this when nothing is given like where there's no givens so i think that in the world as we demarcate our space and our philosophies and our ways of being and we hold them to be the uncontestable truth I think the potentiality is a lot more useful <laughs> because you can actually go, okay, that's weird. And I don't know how that got in there, but let's work with that. What, what is that? How does that fold in as a concept, as a knowledge, as a way? Um, yeah. So it's, it's all about the interspace. I think the inter yeah. inter engagement interaction and uh, Ms. Jack Lange Murphy has just made herself visual and Jackie and I have been working um, for God, how long, 10 years longer um, and Jackie and I have been working very closely on lots of these issues, particularly around Miti Miti, um, which Jackie's writing about in Indigenous Stars book. And it is my kind of flavour to be in dialogue. So I'd like to just really briefly open it to you, Jackie, to just share any of your observations and contextualising from an American point of view as well. Okay, nice to see you. I think it's 13 years because that's how old my twins are. Oh. <laughs> they were babies when I met them. Um, and I actually just wanted to amplify something that you said that really struck me as true. And in fact, it's being embodied now, which is that it's not so much what happened. It's not the final product, like what happens that matters. It's the intention and the way and the manner and the relationships in which it occurs. And all of your stories have said that in different ways. And even it never occurred to me before, but when you were telling the story of Papatuanuku and the separation, like the fact that they had to have a conversation, the children, they had to like kind of figure it out together in a way, not just go and kill somebody um, or, you know, consider that as an option, but not do it um, was really striking to me. And I think it's really at the core of a major difference that I experienced. I have experiences between, you know, I guess my world of Western academic and, production-based ways of being where like getting to the end and having a good product and making sure everything works out is so what drives everything versus one of the things I've learned from you and from your work is to really step back and focus on what the intention of what you're doing is and why and let that lead and kind of let go a little bit of what the final thing's going to be. Um, so I, um, yeah, that's one thing that I've been thinking about as you've been talking. Thank you, Jackie. Kia ora. Um, and also just with our culture, we're an oral culture. So talking is is a really um, navigated thing. And I, yeah, and, and it's the plating of conversation that actually creates the greater being. And um, yeah, that's just something that is really important to me because it's sort of, decentralizes me from the main thing too and and makes it about the opportunities and the potentials to grow beyond that and to take root in other people's lives um okay so 
on that note, we are going to do a, a little experiment as a workshop, and um, and I invite you all to participate. Uh, it's an audio recording that I'll be playing from my computer that will beam out to you guys. And it seems weird because I'm talking to you now, but it's kind of funny, you know, play the audio and we'll just follow along to that guy. Um, you'll need a couple of things and um, I'll just show you what they are. So something to write on or draw on and something to write and draw with. Different colours would be good if you have. Um, what else? Um, do uh, You'll need a, a phone to take fo a photo and you'll need a body. <laughs> Use yours. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, and so I'm just going to play that, and then I'll just give you a little lead. Oh, no, do I need to give a lead-in? The only lead-in I'm going to give is that I created this work um, specifically for um, Asian Pacific American Smithsonian Museum. Um, they came to New Zealand to work with the Auckland Museum. They made a group exhibition showing called um, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting the name. It'll come to me. Uh, Te Whainga. And it was about civility. It was the culture lab on civility. Okay, thanks. I remember. And and so there was this these silos. So they're like these um, concrete chambers at the bottom of town by the waterfront. And that's where the work was all exhibited. Different things. There was installations, projections. There were live um, performative things, there were people making food, tea, there were things on the ground, so in the context of this, my work was a, an audio work where people put on headphones and they moved around collectively together and, and it was a tour that happened continuously because one of the things that I was exploring was how does dance exhibit itself over three days? Um, you know, is it a one-off thing? Is it like a highlight moment? Is it the opening? But I wanted to consider what is physicality? Um, what is physicality in the space and how does how do I address that? And so I kind of went, well, the, the form, the bodies that I have are the audience themselves. And so I got them to, I choreographed them <laughs> and they danced around the space for three days um, ongoingly. So we're going to do Jack's lockdown version um, and you're going to be in your room where you are, make space as you need. I'll try and do it as well. And then there's the part where you can, if you want to go walk around your house, um, but take your laptop with you. I'll just do it here. Or maybe I will go around. And then there's another part where you can go outside. So those are all the components and it's about 20 something minutes. All right. So does that sound good with everyone? Groovy, thank you. Here we go. Uh, playing the music. Kia ora. No mai, haere mai, whakatau mai rā. Welcome to this space. Ko Jack Gray taku ingoa, ko kai kani kani aho. My name is Jack Gray and I am a dancer. This audio move experience has been co-created in collaboration with Yana from Papaya Stories. We are pleased to share this 20 minute experience with you as part of Te Whainga, a culture lab on civility at Silo Park, acknowledging the support of co-presenters, Tamaki Painga Hira, the Auckland Museum and Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center. Whakarungo, listen. Take a moment to connect within. Let's start with our feet. Step your feet hip width apart and place your hands down by your sides. I want you to breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth. Hongi, breath in. Puha, breath out. Ano, let's do this again. Hongi. Breath in. Puha. Breath out. I want you to put your hands on your hips. Stand with mana, authority. Let your shoulders be strong. 
your backbone connecting from your tailbone to your head. Lift your chin and notice the fullness of your presence. If you need to make space for other people, trust yourself to navigate that easily and naturally. I'm going to ask you to put your attention into your feet. Have a sense of your weight. Is it more on the balls of your feet or on your heels? See if you can center yourself so your weight is evenly distributed. I want you to lift your toes. Take a big breath in and out. Release your toes to the earth, to Papa Tuanuku, the earth mother. Connect. We are going to bend our knees, slightly tracking our knee joints directly over the toes. Bend for two counts. And straighten for two counts. Let's do that again. Kiraro, go down. Tahi, rua. And kirunga, go upwards. Tahi, rua. Kapai. Let's put our hands by our sides. I want you to wiri your hands. It is a trembling motion, quick, sharp vibrations. Some say the wiri comes from the wind, blowing through trees. We will now raise our arms directly in front of our chest. Kia wiri. Keep trembling the hands. Feel the energy this brings. This energy is called ihi. Let's put our hands on our hips again and repeat the kupu after me. Kōrero mai. Speak after me. Ihi. Your turn. Ihi. One more time. Ihi. Your turn. Ihi. Kāpai. Ihi is your inner fire. It is an energy that is created from within. Speaking of within, how about we explore our own standing place, our tūranga waiwai. Kōrero mai, say with me, tūranga. Tūranga. Waiwai. Waiwai. Tūranga means to stand, position, situation, sight. Waiwai. Leg, foot, footprint. Altogether, I want you to stamp your right foot. I'll count you in. Toru, fa, stamp. Let's do that again. Toru, fa, stamp. Kapai, very good. Now that we have activated our tinana, our body, and our breath, and connected to Papa Tuanuku, I want us to consider our footprint in standing place or tūranga waiwai. I'm going to give you a provocation. You will look for a piece of chalk on the floor by the wall. I want you to find a space to draw. It could be on the wall or the floor, somewhere in this vicinity. I'm going to invite you to make some marks. It could be a drawing of a place a feeling you associate your standing place with? Where is your tūranga waiwai? What does it look like, feel like, remind you of? Is it a maunga, a mountain, an awa, a river? Did you travel by waka or canoe? Do you know your ancestors' names? I'm going to play a short piece of music and give you time to start drawing, mark making and sharing a piece of yourself and what you identify with. There is no right or wrong. Are you ready? Timata, go. <laughs>
Nice drawings. Love the colour and some of those images there. Tino a tahua. Beautiful. Okay, so now we have created our foundation for our journey ahead. We are free to move out of one of three doorways. <laughs> Point to the north facing door, Tokero. Point to the east facing door, Rafati. Point to the south facing door, Taitonga. You can leave your belongings here with the guide, but you must take your iPhone with you. Point to any one of the doors, and on my word, you may commence. Ready? Haere ki mua, go forth. I want you to go for a quick journey through the silo spaces and think about the energy we created in the standing place. We want to share this breath and consciousness. So walk tall, effortlessly and gracefully. Choose a pace that matches your internal rhythms. Connect to the beat of your heart. Listen deeper. Whakarongo. You are on your own journey, yet there are other people around. Don't be afraid to look at people in the face as you move around. Not in an overt way, but just taking their humanity into your gaze. You can go anywhere you want in the silos. Be mindful of the people you pass and navigate accordingly. I want you to now choose a spot, somewhere private to stop. It could be by a wall, hidden or in view. You might want to lean against the wall or sit by an object. Whatever you do decide, make it purposeful, quiet and unapologetic. It's not to obstruct or cause a stir but just to explore the different ways we can be in space. Now, as the place and what you do in it reveals itself to you, concentrate again on your breath. Hongi. Huha. Kapai. I want you to now get your iPhone ready to take a photo. This photo can be of anything, but it must be something that catches your eye and draws you into a contemplative moment. Maybe you want to express an emotion. Tune in. Maybe you see something like your shadow on the wall. Or maybe it is a self-time photo that you place on the other side of the room. I'm going to give you 60 seconds to take the photo now. Thirty more seconds. And now that we have ended, you are going to return immediately to the standing place where we begun the tour. You will see your guide with a table for your iPhone. 
Choose your best photo now and place your phone display up on the table. Te o mai, what can you see? Everyone in the world sees something different. We each have a unique perspective and we embody that daily. It is important to remember this and also to notice that with diversity is also universality. As a dancer, I work within the intangible realms a lot. My body feels different day to day and my memories inform my future. Thinking back to the marks you made on the wall, did you connect that imprint to your photo? Isn't it an amazing thing to capture a moment as fleeting as it is? When we combine our inner energies together, we create wehi, the feeling of connection, impulses that respond to each other. Mm. Look as we respond to the space around us and our inner world. Pick up your phone now. It's time to go for a journey to the outside world. Mm. Let's do this safely. Follow your guide out of the silo, exiting to the concrete below. There are access elevators if you require. <laughs> Otherwise, it's a simple walk down the stairs. Let's listen to a track of music as we do this. Oh, and you'll need a piece of chalk for later, so make sure you have one in hand. Haere tonu. Let's move ahead. <laughs> Okay, moving on. Or maybe Let's move you on. can do short little runs and freeze just for a moment. Play with the speed of time. Sometimes I like to walk backwards. It makes me aware of the backspace. Lead with your spine. Look left, look right, look up, look down, curve. Maybe touch a part of your body, your forehead, or maybe touch the ground or someone else's arm. Do so gently. I want you to be in time with the space around you. Is it fast or slow or in between? Can you connect your breath to these movements? Hongi. Hoo-ha. You have reached your final destination. Look out and connect to Tangaroa, the ocean. Every day is different, sometimes sunny, sometimes rainy, sometimes grey. Nothing is constant, and yet all things are continuous, overlapping and fluid. Why water is necessary to life? It separates and connects. It allows things to flow. And with life comes death in the portals to other places, realities and understandings. If you stood on other shores, other distant lands, islands,
continents. I always love to soak my feet in the moana. Feeling the temperature of the water gives me an idea of how close I am to home. Our ocean climate is cold here. It is brisk and filled with modi, energy, currents. To me, water speaks of cleansing and clearing. I'd like to teach you a waiata as our last thing together. Feel free to unmute. Don't be shy. It's just me and you. Waiata mai. Sing with me. Let's do a call and response. I'll go, then you go. Okay? Koto. Koto. Matau. Matau. Waka. 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 Kote. 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 Marie, Marie, Te hoi, Te hoi, Oh, 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 Runga, Runga, Kopuna, Oh, Kopuna, Oh, Te aroha. Te Oyanora, Oyanora, E haire mai ai, E haire mai ai, O te ara, O te ara, Anaga, Hey, hey, Mama, Mama, Rawa, Rawa, Thank you so much for singing this blessing for me. Think of a wish you want to send out to the Moana and beyond and use your witty to activate it across the waves, trembling your fingers towards the water to send it on its way. Meet your guide and spend the last minute together writing something or drawing on the concrete to conclude. Do you have a word or feeling you want to express? Thank you so much for embodying this journey. Together we have traveled from our inner world to our outer world. Whakarungo, listen. Let's take one more breath together before we take our headphones off. Hongi. Puha. Thank you, everybody, for your wonderful participation. Um, that was the first time I've ever done that. <laughs> and I totally loved it. So thanks for sharing. Um, we are at a, a little bit of a discussion time. I'm going to turn it over to Gregory now uh, to lead that. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Jack. Thank you for this process and this journey. I, I am really excited to talk to you a little bit more about um, your relationship with the word decolonization. Yeah. I would love for you to um, just take a second to um, open up what that means for you and how it shows yeah. up in your work. For sure. Yeah, I... Um, yeah, yes, yesterday I... I had a really big experience about what what it is to 
the perils of being Māori <laughs> and, um, and why it is that decolonizing my fear about being all that I am and who I am in the realm of the world is really critical and needed. And I think, therefore, to answer that question, um, you know, I want to go back to the somatic level of the body and, um, and the weight that I feel every day and I wake up fresh from conversations with my ancestors from from the dream space from te kore, from the realm of potentiality um, it's a spiritual relationship that guides me and that holds me um, and so to decolonize is to not switch those things off but actually understand and talk to them more and um, knowing that the, the rituals and the guidance that I shared with you today is something that actually our peoples and our children would have received in various ways. But we're not trained, taught a condition to be receptive and open to the sensory experience of the world, the understanding of the natural world, the understanding of our relationship beyond that. So... Yeah, so when I wake in my body, I feel a different type of heaviness and I call it burden, which is really um, the constant surveillance of myself and the censoring of myself and the ex having to explain myself, um, which, which I've chosen to see as an art. I've chosen to see it as an articulation. I've chosen to see it as my own self offering that I am understanding my identity and in the process, enabling and enriching the discourse that can flow with others. So decolonizing to me is a thing that flows inwards and outwards. Um, it's a thing that is about a constant measuring and a new opportunity every time I come to those moments. Uh, I love this idea of what we just shared now because I inhabit my whare, my house, in a very, uh, um, I don't even know what I'm, what pedestrian way, where I'm just literally using it as the place where things are. And I go to that space and I use the shower and I go to that place and I cook and I go to this place and I sleep and I go to this place and I sit and watch Netflix and then I go to this place. And in and, and that moment where we were sharing just now, I actually felt able to access other things that, that are present in my house. My ancestors are all actually on the wall. When I think about them, you know, like I love to think all the way back to the gods, but actually, oh yeah, there's my grandmother right there in that photo. Oh, there's my nephew right there on the fridge. <laughs> and understanding what that is to be a culture that, that prioritizes family and prioritizes people as the core part of who you are. So, um, yeah, so I like to offer, like, as you can see, my work is in so many different spaces, and I'm always constantly thinking about privilege, uh, the privileges in each space that I journey to, and then the things that are, like, the tensions between the realities that I know and that I come from, and then the places that I'm put in to serve a higher purpose, you know, and being a voice um, of my culture being a voice of my own understanding and being a voice of my art form. And, and what I've had to do, because when I travel abroad, I'm not going to find Māori dancers. I'm going to find people of the world. So therefore, the engagement and interaction is a patient exercise in connectivity. So when I'm thinking about decolonizing, I'm thinking about finding ways in which we can have vocabulary to understand the world together. In, in ways that we may not necessarily have started off. And, and this process of coming together, the choreography of listening, the choreography of receiving instructions, the choreography of embodying in oneself, the freeingness, the, the ability to free yourself up to be able to actually express and, and put something powerful into the world, a blessing into the world, to use that term, a sense. Like, and there was certainly a release from beginning to end I, I think that, yeah, that that um, that if things don't release us, we're not really 
activating something if it keeps us constricted if we feel like we haven't quite you know something has to occur um, in that space and and I also find that decolonization isn't in the time that you're in decolonizing happens after you know decolonizing happens in the ripple effects of the way you walk out now and see see the space or that you have a memory that you've implanted in a place that has a deeper resonance that it, that wasn't there before um you know and being a portal like I think I I like to think culturally about we have so many notions of realms that literally moving through realms uh is something you have to do it's not like just happens it's it's not like you are what you are it's like you are so many things and people are going to read you in so many ways and 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 having to contain all of that and feel strong about that is is kind of where i think this, the breath going back to that breath like just you know that life force you know we're here until we're not like that's the reality of it but we so can kind of seek to transform yes Gregory. no thank you thank you for, I, mean, I didn't mean to cut you off but someone no, no. recently wrote um a piece on for thinking dance about decolonization being a buzzword right and i wanted right. to hear from you do you <laughs> think this idea of decolonization is important is it relevant <laughs> why decolonize oh man i'm so giggling because these are great questions um yeah, I mean, I think that it means different things to different people for different reasons. And I think that the work can't be stuck to one idea of what it is. I think that uh, depending on who you are, depending on your power, depending on your privilege, depending on whether you're a settler, whether you understand what that means, whether you, you acknowledge those things, whether you understand the, um, the erasures that have occurred and the purposes of those things. So to answer the question, it's so multifaceted and and everything needs to be in place in order for us to create that collective well-being like there has to be a purpose to it you know and i've learned from so many people and you know i just want to acknowledge you um esther my friend for you know for doing that work and and um you know you and i have done so many things together as well at different points in times we have some really deep conversations so um yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I'd love to hear more about, you know, how we unpick this idea of decolonizing. I think it's useful. I don't think it needs to contain us, but I think that it is something like all things that we can actually just kind of work around with and, and manifest and start to go deeper into, into things. And, and I, I, I just feel like the biggest thing is people knowing things, but not stepping up or saying it. Yes. And, and I think that that's been really something that people are grappling with about uh, how to situate yourself and how to do that in a powerful way. And whether that's to put yourself forward or to put yourself back or to put yourself in, in a different space. And uh, yeah, I, I'd kind of like to see people explore those realms with a bit more uh, layering like that, you know, that sometimes we can just get so stuck in the box of what we think something is. But I, I think that, you know, we always have an opportunity to go back. Like every time we went back to the paper, we never knew what was going to be here. And whether or not this is actually what I wanted to make doesn't matter. With Like I'm just kind of like something was inside me that needed to put this here. And, you know, uh, creating, I, I, I would like to see people dedicate more time to these things you know so that they can work through processes alone and they can work through processes in community with those that need to be in community with them and then come back collectively in situations like this where we've all been considering you know so it's not just kind of passively receiving something that you've never actually freaking thought about Wow. It's, it's really interesting and true that decolonization shows up differently for different people in different parts of the world. And it's really important for us to create space for those conversations. Um, in the interest of time, we have five minutes. I would love for someone from the Zoom space to ask a question. So while they're thinking about the question, I'm going to ask my last question. So I want you to imagine me as this rich white woman. 
I know it's hard to, but I, <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> okay, but anyway, um, so in thinking about your work, because you're really clear yeah. about how community shows up in your work, about your process, about your 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 art making, and yet still you have these people who may not be. Um, uh, aligned with your your language, aligned with your culture, aligned with your traditions, writing about your work. How do I get, as a rich white woman, how do mm. I get access to that work? Yeah. Yeah. I, I suppose, I, I don't know if this, well, I'll just say. So in our country, um, dance theatre is mostly attended by rich white women. Like that that's predominantly... Uh, the sector of our society that go to performance and and patronize the arts. So I've always grown up with that experience. And my teachers were all rich white women. <laughs> and the funding people were all rich white women. And so I, I'm very clearly in relationship to the rich white women. However, I have determinedly uh, and resolutely stuck to my truth and my story and and started to ascertain over the years when something has been extracted from me or when someone is in pure dialogue and and how to create the terms in which that exchange happens or occurs so for example you know i'm just doing my thing as when i was a young dancer trying to figure work, the world out through my art and 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 you know all the wonderful journey that goes with that good bad and otherwise and at a certain point, you start doing something enough that when people say, do you know anyone who's doing Maori or Indigenous dance? Of course, my name pops up. They're like, oh, there's this guy, Jack Gray. And then when I was first introduced to a whole bunch of people, and there have been many, many since, of ac academics, scholars, writers, journalists, all sorts of things, people kind of going, we know that there's an importance to what this realm is. We don't understand. So we're coming into conversation with you. And I've realized over that whole process that uh, there were times where my words weren't held with uh, the, the, the integrity that was required. There were moments where those words were misinterpreted and put out in a way to serve their purposes. And then there were ways where it just completely did not connect. And so I'm... The reason why I'm such an articulator is because it was in my best interest as an artist to grow the understanding that I require. You know, I require, I require people to understand where I'm coming from. And if they can't, then I learn something from that. I learn what is missing between and do I need to create the bridge for that? Or do I need to just know that and note that so that when I'm engaging with them, so it is it is it does mean that I adjust and shift and shape shape shift, but I think that adaptability is is a real um, skill a, as opposed to having to. Like I'm like, oh, I actually want to be able to be in this space and have a conversation where I breathe and let that person think what they're thinking and then just kind of like, you know, maybe like do a little shift, but not the whole shift. And then in other times I'm just like, bam, this is what I mean. So I think there's autonomy in that. There's like, you know, the ability for me to pick and choose. And I've definitely learnt from wasting my time, um, you know, battling causes that are just really not worth it. And so, yeah, centering around the things I know, but also being very open um, to how the exchange occurs. Yeah, so, you know, it is, a bit, it is difficult. I find it really I find it really tricky and I'm always having to work it out. Thank you, Jack. So I thought we would have question, I mean, time for one more question, but I would love for you to maybe put your email address in the chat so anyone willing to engage with you further uh, course, may do that if you are open to it, of course. Yeah, no, no worries. Thank you so much. Um, we've come to the end. I really, really, really appreciate you taking the time on this Friday afternoon, Saturday morning, to Thank spend you. the time with us in this decolonizing dance writing space. Um, this is important to me. It's important to me because as a queer black man from Jamaica, this idea behind decolonization is something I am really running with. And I'm 
completely advocating for. Um, Jack is the third in the series. Our next guest will be Diana Gutierrez from Colombia. Please check out thinkingdance.net. You'll have all the information on that website. And if you want to read on our past guests in terms of an interview and a think piece, all the pieces are also on the website. I will turn it over to Graciela to give us the sign off, sign out piece mode. I think you covered it, Gregory. I think, Jack, thank you so much again. Um, it's been so nice just getting to know you through your work. Um, it's been so nice to also just like, I think from the very first day, you were like, okay, we're about this. Like, wh what is this about? We're about it. And I think, um, you know, you led by example, by also, you know, as we talked about the interview process, as we talked about um, just what that would look like, you even brought your practice into the interview process, saying things like, I want to be in dialogue. I want to be in community throughout this whole thing. So I just, I've so appreciated uh, just witnessing leading up to this and thank you again for everything. Hold on. Well, thank you, everyone. I really appreciate you all here today. Every time is very important to me. And I never forget a group because it's so special. That combination of energy is so special. And I, and I, I really put those energies into the, into the next part and the next part. And that's the longevity of it. You know, this is not something that will be solved immediately or even in the next wee while, but it's something to keep working on and working through. So thank you again for the opportunity and lots of love from Aotearoa. Come and on. we'll keep in touch. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Please have a wonderful day or <laughs> evening. <laughs>